Thank you for coming back to Ossa of the Knife Part 2. Um, in this one you'll see that I hadn't actually made up my mind who he was. And he could have been his own father or possibly uncle. Um, and I've forgotten his name. Horsa. So you'll hear me mention him at one point, but then I shifted. So we'll look into who this fella is in a moment. Uh, but we've got to put him together. So we'll do that first. So here I am making a hell of a mess in the kitchen, generally. And I'm painting the hands holding the axe. And I'm trying to come up with a good flesh colour for a kind of Anglo-Saxon who's spent years raiding and pillaging the southeast coast of England, spent half his life rowing small versions of long ships than the Vikings had. And um, I came up with that colour, which is, once I got it on and seen it in contrast, I thought that's quite dark. Trouble is, I've matched it to my own skin colour. There, <laughs> it looks a bit pink now. There is a little spot there, can you see? Just a little bit darker. And then I remembered, it's just how uh, it looks very pink on the camera. I do not look pink in real life. I look like I've got a heart problem, don't I? Um, anyway, and it reminded me how when I was a young person, like a teen, I used to get chased and racially abused. And he'd say, you go home. And I'd say, oh, me dad's Scottish. At which point they'd shout, kill him. Never mind. So that's, that's accurate for me. I might pale it up a bit if he's an Anglo-Saxon. There's not so much... Yeah, careful what I say there. There's not so much Anglo-Saxon blood in him, but there is probably quite a lot. Because these guys were generation after generation... Mm, what can we say? Kissing and cuddling with British girls. So, it's going to have a fair amount of British there, but a bit of sort of... Uh, Belgian, Holland, Denmark-esque blood in him as well. So there he is, just a little bit paler to go over the top. I'm not going to go wild on the put putty, putties, or putties, whatever they are, around his ankles, because the, thankfully, the uh, sculpting on them is very fine. And that's because they should be made out of a thin fabric or leather and they should be interwoven uh, on a regular basis, perhaps several times a day, and should be done not tight on the leg but tight on the other part of the strap. So you shouldn't have great lines, great shadows appearing. They should, from a distance, appear as a single thing. Um, and you often see First World War figures, particularly English ones or British ones, where the sculpting on them is massive. They would be made out of fabric which must be half an inch to three quarters of an inch thick to be able to do that. And quite clearly that wasn't the case. So to be authentic and visually realistic, I'm going to largely leave them like that and just put a little bit of wash on them. And I'm not going to do that yet because bits of the paint on his feet are wearing. Because that's largely how I hold him. So I anticipated that. I've got to paint the base yet and glue him on. So I won't do anything around the ankles area until he's about to be glued on. And then, obviously, he'll have mud and dust. So it needs to be similar in colour to the base itself. So it's all a, a slow moving process and I probably won't put the shield on until the very end. I'm resisting going wild on the shield. I can't remember if I said this before. What I want to do as usual is keep it simple and the texture on that shield is lovely. That's exactly what I wanted. So I don't want to go putting wild images on there. Problem is the shield hasn't got anything else on it. 
hasn't got any studs, rivets, clips, anything. So it does lend itself to having an image on there. And if he is Horsa, of the Hengiston Horsa brothers, then he might just have a horse. So I might do him, and then another day, paint an image on the shield just for fun, and then show that. I want him to be basic, straightforward, simple. I want him to be tough and professional, not fancy and flouncy. And so a simple shield will do for him. Look at that. What a terrible day. Can't get any light on the fella without getting wet. <laughs> Very British. So let's stay indoors and have a look at the helmet. Um, this is from a book, it's not very clear is it? It's pale on pale. The Northern World, which I got in a sale of books from a library about four, three or four hundred years ago. The, can we see? The History and Heritage of Northern Europe, edited by David M. Wilson. And it has, I can usually find it, I bet I won't this time. I mean, it's just lashings of fabulous illustrations, but here we go. This is him. Look at that. Isn't that incredible? That is a find from Scandinavia. Um, I think this one's from Vendel in Sweden and it's absolutely inspirational and this is pretty much the one that our figure has got I wanted to downplay his um, illustriousness as I was saying because this mostly iron but it's got slightly different metal work there which um, made it look probably rather fab but I just want to keep it flat and a dull metal so this is the original. Fantastic stuff. So here he is uh, with a cardboard box background trying to catch some light from the window and just to get some clue. I'm about to stick the blank shield on. So we'll sort of be done. I don't want to do much on the base because first of all it's its edges are completely smooth so it just suggests its base. Secondly it's just sand and rocks so they're just going to be sandy and rocky. So a little more than that will do. So here we go, shield on. It's all a bit blue, isn't it? I'll have to do something with the shield one day, but uh, I'm very fond of that texture. And folks did have plain shields. So we'll have him like this for the minute, and then I'll work on him uh, in a while, not immediately. He's a nice figure. Good bit of sculpting going on. Proportions are good. And that's him. So here we have a very early Saxon warrior. Um, he could easily be from uh, several centuries for any time, like the 300s through the 4s into the 5s. As I've been saying, this kind of stuff got handed down quite a lot, so it had a, a long lifespan. Why have I picked this Ossa of the Knife as my character? Well. I think he's a very interesting chap. Um, 
there's only a tiny little fragment about him in what most people would consider complete fiction and mythology. Um, the truth is, uh, way back in the four, five, six hundreds, people didn't write fiction. They wrote stuff that, that had been handed down, and they were allowed to embellish it. So if somebody's a victor, they kill tens of thousands of people and blood flows like rivers and all of that kind of thing, but they have to stick to the main story. So there's a, a strong level of truth in a lot of this stuff. Anyway, what we've got is an ancient document from the early 800s, supposedly by a chap called Nennius, who it was a monk, um, and he was compiling in a li from his library where he was, he was compiling a history of um, kind of post-Roman Britain from various books. He says he's not a historian, he's just created a heap, and his heap is fascinating. And you have these two little sections that are very interesting. Once the Romans had slipped away, Britain is run by a council, because it very quickly falls into a number of small kingdoms. But the heads of these kingdoms come together in a council, and the head of the council, who has been elected, is a man called Vortigern. That appears to be a nickname, but we'll worry about him another day. And Vortigern has problems with the Picts and with an opposition party who've armed themselves against him. And so he gathers together an elite band of professional troops, and part of them is a group of Germanic mercenaries from what we would now call Holland. And they are Hengist and Horsa. And they are pretty tough and pretty shrewd characters um, and they are they're the, the origin of apparently the origin of the arrival of the Anglo-Saxons into Britain. Nennius has an interesting little section on their arrival it goes like this in the meantime three vessels exiled from Germany arrived in Britain they were commanded by Horsa and Hengist brothers because they worked for pay, not for tradition or for strange um, ancient loyalties or anything like that. These guys were remarkably loyal to Vortigern. They pretty much became his bodyguard. And they were his fixers. And uh, they, they realised that they could deal with a lot of Vortigern's problems for him. After defeating Vortigern's rivals near at hand, Vortigern's main problem was with the Picts. They're wild folk right up in the sort of mountains of Scotland. And Hengist says to him, I will be to you both a father and an advisor. Despise not my counsel, and you shall have no reason to fear being conquered by any man or any nation whatever. For the people of my country are strong, warlike and robust. If you approve, I will send for my son and his brother, both valiant men, who at my invitation will fight against the Picts, and you can give them the countries in the north about the wall. That's Hadrian's Wall. There is the Antonine Wall further north, but that had pretty much decayed, and it had been forgotten in the south. So... These chaps are being given the countries about the wall, which is fascinating. So they are settling up here. Um, and he says, having assented to this, Octha and Ibusa arrived with 40 ships. In these they sailed round the country of the Picts and took possession of many regions, even to the Pictish confines. So they were a success. What's interesting is, None of this is new. Even the arrival of Horsa and Hengist um, is a traditional thing. The Romans had been bringing boatloads of mercenaries in on a regular basis and using them as garrison troops in forts across Britain, but particularly on Hadrian's Wall. And there are stones with dedications to different um, gods and goddesses, and the troops who've sort of paid for the carving and the probably sacrifices and things have left their local name 
where they came from, their homeland. And so many of them are from what would later be considered the Anglo-Saxon homelands and are now basically Belgium, Holland and Denmark. So it's the same people time and time again. So depositing Octa and Ibiza, Ibiza up on the wall is just standard practice. But it's interesting that it's pointed out so clearly. The other thing is, I know the names don't sound the same, but different documents have the same characters, but with different and slightly messy versions of their names. So you have Eopa and Eosa and things like that. Essa and Eopa. They're all the same characters. And one writer back in the 1800s, W.F. Skeen, um, in his book Four Ancient Books of Wales, suggests that Eosa is Eo what in uh, Welsh legend is Osa, I'll get this wrong, Osa Selelor, which translates as Osa of the Knife. And in Welsh tradition, he's one of the Saxon enemies of Arthur at the end of the 5th century. So you have here a character with what is pretty much the same name. I mean, it is, in effect, as Ossa. So you have Ossa rolling back to Eossa, um, who's uh, a real rival of Arthur. Chronologically, that wouldn't be too bad. If Arthur was fighting him when, he was, when Arthur was young, Eossa, or Ossa, would be uh, a mature man, let's say. So you've got some little points all the way through. So this fella, Ossa of the Knife, would have been wearing this kind of gear. This is pretty much him. So I think it's good because it brings this character right up sort of within a few miles of where I live now. So he is one of the characters who was becoming a power broker in early Northumbria. Which means I probably need to do another film about what Northumbria is and isn't. But anyway, there we are. So this is our man. These are the kind of guys who were raiding and then being hired. That way, if you hire them, they stop raiding. So they're like Vikings, in effect. They're, uh, you know, in many respects, they are early Vikings. They come from virtually the same area, very same, similar culture and the same practices. So they're raiding, they're burning things down, hence a lot of flames, and um, eventually getting hired to keep them quiet and shut them up. In later times, the Vikings are given Danegeld. So this is our man. I hope that made sense. You never know, could just be rambling. The figure's very good, on the other hand. Uh, the detail's good, the... Um, quality of research is good and um, he holds together well proportions are good all of that so uh, an enjoyable build and paint up I've just noticed that I haven't there's a strap runs across his shoulder around his neck that I've left blue and it should be brown anyway there we go hope you enjoyed it folks there will be more as soon as possible technology permitting and uh, I do not know what will be next. There we go. So thanks for watching part two and see you all soon.